Ben Cloy. I'm a Marine veteran, husband, father to three kids, eight, five, and three. I reside in Madison or just south of Madison, Wisconsin. I've lived pretty much in Wisconsin all my life. Grew up on a farm about 30 minutes from where I lived here or where I live now. Went to the Marine Corps right after high school, served four years, got a very good education and in the seeds of life planted within me, but didn't necessarily understand what it all meant. I did a lot of time in Okinawa, Japan, where I did three years. I saw a lot of Asia. Never saw any combat in Iraq or Afghanistan. Transitioned out of the Marine Corps in 2007 with just the simple idea that I was meant for bigger things in life. And I didn't have any idea what that actually meant, but that was what I knew at least I had that spidey sense way back then. Got out, right. adopted the civilian program that says you get a job, you get interviews, you start a life, you get married, you have kids. And for about 10 years, oh, and you get a degree, which I failed, dropped out, and had to kind of reinvent myself. Got lost probably for a good 10 years. And through that 10 years, one thing I forgot was my love of leadership. And it took a seminar where I learned where it was just uh, making its transition from staff to supervisor, got reignited with that passion for leadership from the Marine Corps. That started my self-growth journey, which would probably happen way back in 2014. And then in 2016, I started hanging around some different dads groups, which really got me excited to be a dad. And then through all of that, then I started this idea of a side hustle. And at the time, all it was was a life coaching that lasted for a month. And then I transitioned to a life coach as a veteran. But the problem was I didn't believe I was a life coach. I liked the idea. I did not think I was. So really all I was good at was I just kind of went to the gym, kind of if you use the gym as an example, I went to the gym, but did a whole bunch of random exercises with no cohesiveness of why all the muscle groups were getting work. So I worked on writing, I worked on networking, I worked on creating friendships, I worked on just kind of in the process of putting yourself out there, started getting on some podcasts, and it took me going to a military influencer conference in 2018, where I just had this idea for a veteran dad podcast, and I was like, I still don't necessarily feel this is right, or I don't feel that this is what I'm meant to do. But I told my story to a military spouse at that conference, and I brought her to tears to that story. And that was September of 2018. And that plane ride home, I wrote the business plan for the podcast that I have today and the mission to bring every dad home. And on January 1st, 2019, I launched my podcast with the scary idea that this was probably the most radical thing that I've done with my life since joining the Marine Corps. <laughs> and it's been over a year now that I've had this podcast. I do two episodes a week now because last uh, about November of 2019, I realized I had more things I wanted to say than airtime to say them. And you're a podcaster, right. you can really be as flexible as you want. So I started right. Fatherhood Fridays, and I do an interview show on Monday, Fatherhood Fridays. And it all continued to change with one more pivot of January 27th that all changed because I lost my job. My position at work was eliminated after eight years. And I had no idea it was coming, so it completely just one day, everything changed. But about two weeks after that, I realized that my podcast essentially saved my life because it was the one thing that I could keep looking forward to every day or every week, right. that it was a new mission, even though my other mission had went away. And right. about two weeks, I woke, I went to work one day and I was like, you know what? I have never felt more alive. And as this week, as life has been going forward, I get more and more excited because I've been a dad. My focus is to be a stay-at-home dad. Like I'm done trying to get a job. I'm done trying to do all these things. I just want to be dad more than anything and right. help other dads with the same love and passion. So I have a podcast. I'm working on growing a public speaking business. COVID has put a little bit of a damper on that, but the, the goal is still there. And I'm working on a whole bunch of other couple of different things to try to pivot the idea and continue to try to turn what I want my life to be into into a business. Fantastic. What got you into the military? What was your stepping stone to get in there? Uh, it's an interesting story because all I wanted was computers. And oh, yeah. so I didn't really <laughs> feel like college was my thing. And yeah. I was like, I was always good with computers. So I was just kind of like, without a better idea, it sounded like, okay, that's a good idea. And so I was like, I looked at all the branches, not very well though, because I crossed off the Marine Corps because I thought they were only infantry. And I was like, nope, don't want that. <laughs> didn't want to be on a boat and the army just didn't look really interesting to me. And yeah. so I went to the air force. It's easier because I'd always taken the easier route up to that point. And they're very computerized. Seems yeah. like a perfect fit. Talked to the recruiter. He came out. And, but the problem was two weeks later, 
the recruiter was at our church picnic and this day changed my life because that he had a bouncy house at our church picnic. So the kids yeah. are all jumping on it. And my mom wants me to make sure that I'm exploring all my options. So she goes over and talks to him first. Cause I'm too scared to talk oh, to him because he's geez. a Marine. He's intimidating. Yeah, yeah. And but little did I know he was a number one recruiter in Wisconsin three years in a row. Oh. So I was hook, line and sinker at that point. So yeah, I talked yeah, to him yeah. and the guidance counselor on Tuesday find out the Marine Corps has every job that everybody else has. And two weeks later, I'm raising my right hand for the Marine Corps, which was the exact opposite of the path. And <laughs> it was almost kind of like my dare to be great moment. Like, I have yeah. no idea where this path is going to take me. It scares the hell out of me. I would have been voted least likely to join the Marine Corps because I couldn't run. I couldn't do a pull up. Like all of physical fitness was not something that was part of my daily life. Baseball right. was like the only sport that I ever played, but yeah. I did it. I survived. And now it's, it's part of me. It's, it's a growth exercise that I'm still unpacking to this day. Almost. So when they, later. when they said that, okay, you're, you're good to go. What was going through your head? Uh, probably waiting to be found out. Like <laughs> I hope they don't found out, found out or find out that, that I'm not supposed to be here. That this guy yeah. that says he wants to raise his right hand and did is essentially an imposter of a Marine that inside, I was just a, a scared, dumb farm boy that, didn't yeah. think he was going to do anything big with his life. And right. it was almost kind of like two egos battling each other. Like one said, like, Ben, you need to do this because you're going to get to great places. The other person said, no, we don't, we don't take big risks like that. That's something yeah. that other people do, but you're not one of those people. Right. Was that the best move you made? I mean, obviously, it was hands down, kids, because, but I mean, like, yeah. Yeah. Because it was like the very first defining moment, I would say. It, but, and I've continued to try to like kind of measure the things that I've done in my life by those harder challenges. Like right. being a Marine, you like it, it's part of me forever. It's not something that ends like the other branches. Like we are ingrained with you once a Marine, always a Marine. And there's a strength that I, I've I lost for a lot of years, but I've in the last like six months, I've really used the, like the moment that that Eagle Global Anchor was put in my hand at graduation like that's a powerful moment of extreme emotion. And I've been using that moment as a strength because that moment always exists because I'm always a Marine. And so it's right. almost like a well that I can now reach back to and really pull from on a day that I need a lift up to be like, you're a United States Marine. You've got this, you improvise, adapt and overcome, find the next mission, tackle, conquer and move on. Right. What happened? Uh, how did they get you to Japan? So they the hook, line, and sinker as well. Uh, so okay. <laughs> they give you a piece of paper in school, yeah, and th they tell you Lejeune, Pendleton, or Okinawa. Those are your three choices. Everything else doesn't count. And there are other bases, but they didn't put them on this piece of paper. I listed, I want to say, Pendleton, Lejeune, Okinawa. They took, they sent me to Okinawa. Okay, but it wasn't just any transfer orders to Okinawa because they gave me papers that said, oh, one year time on the island. But when I arrived. Somehow the Marine Corps and the government, they can do what they want. And I was part of the first group of Marines to come to the island with no longer one-year mandatory. They switched it to two-year mandatory because it got too expensive to move people on and off. So okay. mandatory two years on the island, no matter what. And right. the first year is kind of hard because you can't have a car. You're riding the bus everywhere. You don't have your PFC, maybe a Lance Corporal if you're lucky. But by year two, I had been able to get a license, and that gives you freedom. And then when you explore it, like – that maybe want to do a third year because you actually get incentivized. Like you get you can either get some pay or 30 days of leave. So I took 30 days of leave to extend for a year. And I just did all my time there. And I wouldn't do it any other way because that that environment, I've never nobody in my family has a passport. So the idea that a farm boy from Wisconsin in my family lived in Okinawa yeah. doesn't it wasn't something that was on anybody's radar probably. But that gave me a depth to the world. Like I've been to the Philippines, Korea. I've been to DMZ and stared down the North Koreans. Like all of that just gives you a different perspective when everything in the world is going chaotic. When North Korea hits the headlines, you feel it differently because you've been there. When, yeah. when something devastating happens in a poor country, you feel it differently because I've been there when devastating, devastating right. things happen in a poor country. Yeah. Or you just understand how other people live their lives. Like in Okinawa, they're very a slower pace of life like they don't have road rage that's not right. they're never in a hurry to get anywhere and, and that's coming from a farm boy so you're that means a lot <laughs> yeah <clears throat> like and so you learn to like appreciate different things by saying that yeah. and 
most Americans don't spend that time doing it. And this is why I love the podcast or my podcast, because military dads have this instinctive depth to their view of the world. And if we can help bring that to our family, we can create that much stronger of an adult. Absolutely. So when you had kids, um, did it change your view on what you wanted to do? Was it more of a now I'm set my goals on my family and whatever dumb stuff I did as a kid and all that stuff was kind of wiped out? Or did it take time for you to adapt to that kind of fatherly aspect of your life? I would say, if anything, it accelerated the misery. Okay. And, and what I mean by that is so the one theme through most of my life was I was always alone. I didn't have I didn't have a successful dating life. I didn't have a lot of friends. I had people I called friends, but I wouldn't have said like that, that I would have called them like best friends. And right. a lot of times I never felt comfortable being what I needed to be. Like I would always try to step into whoever I thought they needed to be in order to be friends. Like if it was a click in high school or a click in the Marine Corps, I would become what I thought they needed me to be in order right. to fit in. And the more times you try to fit in, the more you lose yourself. And so right. I had my first daughter, I think, when I was 28, and that really just accelerated like, wow, I'm responsible for this life in my hands, and she's going to look up to me in a way that I need to set the bar higher, and that almost just kind of made me feel worse because like, I am nowhere anywhere close to someone that I want to be modeled, and it all kind of came to a head when I turned 30, which was my first midlife crisis because I was going through the struggle that I didn't think anybody was going to be there or at my funeral to say any nice things, or even at the end of like, say a retirement ceremony that all these people would come out of the woodwork and thank you for coming into their life. And it was just a very lonely and isolated place. And right. then if a little bit after that, um, someone gave me some advice that kind of really gave me a, a second pivot to change my life that if you want a result in your life, you've never had, then you need to start doing something you've never done. And so for me to fix that loneliness, I was like, okay, I've never really had friends. That's, a res that's something I've never had, but I always wanted. Well, it's not something I'm doing. I was like, okay, I'm not talking to people. And in my head, every person I would talk to, or every new person at least, was that high school girl that was going to reject me. And it would just be like, you don't want to relive that feeling, Ben, so avoid it at all costs, even if it's a regular would you guy. Get, so you're would not you like get anxiety from this? It wasn't so much anxiety. I would just take a left turn instead of going straight. And kind right, of okay. like avoid it. Yeah. And by, so I was like, okay, where can I start saying hello and start talking to people? And one place I was kind of like itching to try, but always kind of talk myself out of it was the park. So a dad at the park with his kids is kind of like a good baseline. Like, okay, he's at least trying to be a good dad and be present. And, right. and I was like, always wanted to say hello, but I was like, I just, they probably just want to play with their kids. They don't want to talk like they've had had a long day they don't want to hang out with anybody but then right. i was like after getting through this and working up the fear or working through it i just said you know what bs i'm gonna say hello and it turns out they were just waiting for someone to say hello too it was it was just kind of like we were both kind of waiting for one of us to say hello and the crazy yeah. part is the third person i said that to at the park was a veteran i was like wow i just met a brand new friend that now i can relate to and we're right. still friends today and it was over 10 years ago but yeah. it all started like my like origin story for where I am today kind of started when I started talking to dads at the park, because then I was like, wow, that really worked really well. I wonder where else it can work. So then I took it to grocery stores and target and then airplanes and airports. And now to the point I describe it, I'm addicted to talking to strangers because <laughs> like in my, my motto on it now is like the, like the amount of opportunity you feel in your life is directly proportional to the amount of strangers you talk to daily because right. you can't create opportunity unless you're talking to people, it's very Absolutely. difficult to create it in a vacuum, but no one Absolutely. really thinks like that. Like you want a better job. Well, then you're going to talk to two people a day that you don't know about because every time you talk to someone, you see the world in a different way because they live their life with a different filter and you get to get to see a version of that. You get to see someone who works an hour a day and you're like, how does someone work an hour a day? I bust my ass for 12 hours. Like I didn't even think that was possible. Well, once right. you meet them, you, you know that it's possible. So it just continues to enrich your life and open up new ways to, to live it. And that's been my motto. And that's essentially how it worked myself up to and having the podcast that it's a platform to talk to people of strangers that I've never met before and then learn from them and then help everybody else around me learn from it at the same time. 
And when you find uh, that you are fi- talking to people on your podcast, are you trying to relate to a certain type of people or are you just looking for a large demographic and trying to find kind of like this one to make what makes them all tick that is probably similar to what yours is? Well, I'm not sure exactly where it hit me that I came with this insight, but so I came up with the, the idea of my podcast, September, 2018, it took me a month to name it, even though my podcast is a military veteran dad. So it's a simple name, but it took me a month because I was overthinking it. But then through that process, the next process that everybody tells you is, what's your perfect listener? Question I was asking you. Well, I realized through the process, like, I'm my perfect listener. Absolutely. And so I created the, the podcast, essentially, when every time I'm interviewing, I'm looking for a piece of gold that, that would have helped Ben Cloy at age 30. Right. That person who's at that same pit what would have changed his life faster and quicker to get him to where he can feel connected to his family, his work, his life, and to get him to step into that life and come home. And so every interview I'm, I'm thinking of, and I named him Daniel, my avatar and my middle name is Daniel. So it's kind of an inside joke, but every every time I'm interview, I'm looking for that gold that I needed for my life. And it's some advice I give with podcasting. If you're stuck, like what podcast you could do, or maybe you got 10 podcast ideas, like, just go inward. Like yeah. what podcast would have changed your life five years ago? And then be that podcast. Cause there's 8 billion people in the world. And someone is at the stage you were at five years ago that could lo- would love to have a resource. Oh, absolutely. How to get through what you went through. Yeah. And, but why, why fatherhood? What was, uh, what is it, what is it about fatherhood that kind of grasped you towards that topic? Mostly. I think it was the idea of pulling out the value of fatherhood in myself and connecting yeah. with my kids and having the kid be such a young age, like this is, it was just kind of a more connected season of my life. But then if I go back to the leadership, like I remembered a moment in the Marine Corps that I had forgotten about that one thing I loved doing was taking Marines that people had given up on and turning them into Marines, like finding that gem inside them and pulling them out and giving them and letting them step into that label. They don't feel comfortable wearing kind of like myself. Right. And that's a lot of what I'm doing for dads. Like people get labeled the dad and it's not a bad thing. But often dads don't don't feel comfortable with it, especially if you're not dealing with your emotions and your feelings inside. You maybe reject that label because you don't feel qualified for that label. So when I stepped into my role as a dad and I saw it experientially change my life, that got me that much more excited to help do it for others. And it eventually led to me with this idea that I got through my podcast that like your legacy is your family, not anything else you do. Like and Kobe Bryant left us this advice when he left. Like people aren't remi- reminding, remembering him for his basketball career. They're remi- remembering him for his family and what the girls he left behind. Like yeah. that's where life matters. So once yeah. I got connected into this purpose and legacy, I was like, this is what's going to ignite fathers. And if you want to start changing the world, like I just try to help a dad at a time because one dad that connects with his kids that helps their kids become better adults that's how you start changing the world in a way they move centuries, not just in a few years. What are some dads coming to you for? What do you think are some of the major issues that they have overcome to overcome? I think the first one, they have to acknowledge that emotions aren't something that are to be suppressed. They're meant to be felt and understood. That's something that emotions in battle will get, keep you alive. Like that fight or flight, the anxiety, the adrenaline, all of those heightened emotions will keep you alive, but we don't realize that same set of tools is how you can connect with your kids. And oftentimes if your kids are making you uncomfortable, we we retreat because we don't feel safe inside when we feel uneasy when our kids are yelling or maybe they're crying or maybe they're throwing a tantrum. And if that usually makes us uneasy inside, we retreat instead of engage because one thing that I've learned through this podcast is as a masculine father, you can have the ability to calm a child's storm, whether it be a boy or a girl. Like your presence and strength through that wind that they're feeling inside can help get them through that. Yeah. But you retreat. And that is often the first issue that most dads, and oftentimes they retreat to two conclusions. One, their whole life explodes because the wife gets the kids out of the house because maybe you're angry, you're bringing uh, fear, or you're frightening the kids if you really aren't controlling maybe PTSD type right. stuff. Yes. Or the other one is you convince yourself that your family's better without you and that you're a burden in their life right. and you take your own life, which all you do then is pass that pain on and create a scar in their heart that they never understand and how to heal. Yeah. 
Um, do you find that you've speak, spoken to a lot of fathers that do have PTSD? I think we all have some form of PTSD. It's, it's different. It's labeled in different things. And the best way that I like to explain it is it's a lot of it's post-traumatic growth disorder that we experience in whatever category of PTSD you have. You experience a lot of life in a short amount of time that takes years and decades and maybe a lifetime to learn. Sometimes you learn in 10 minutes. Yeah. And a lot of that compression is what creates that, that heart, that hardened understanding of trying to keep it in. And it's very hard to keep something compressed in, but, and it's hard in the moment, but the one principle that I try to speak about is that it all happens, not necessarily for a reason, but you can find a purpose within that, that hurt. And even my podcast, like it was hurtful that I didn't have any friends and now it's turned into something powerful. There are several speakers that are out there that have gone through traumatic anything. And they're now public speakers being able to help others walk through that dark time. Right. And if you also think of it, like a lot of anything that happens in, in a very uh, short amount of time, it's like a thousand piece snap on toolbox that like there's a thousand wrenches in there that you no longer, you have any idea what they're for. But there will be a moment where you'll find that special wrench and you're like, that's what it's for. But in that moment will happen when your daughter is struggling when she's 16 with something at school. Right. And you'll be able to go into your toolbox and pull something experiential out and say, I got a story for you that I think is going to help you get you through this. Yeah. That story, however it came into your life, now serves someone else. So when you can figure out how whatever happened to you and figure out how to serve it, especially even your kids like, we don't often engage with stories with our kids about what we feel inside or what our life was like. That's true. But that's often the best teaching method. That that's true. Yeah. Even if even the worst PTSD moment, if you can really step into the fear of facing whatever that feeling is and getting through it, that yeah. moment, whatever happened can be a very powerful teaching tool for your kids as they enter adulthood. Absolutely. Uh, do you find that like for myself, that specific topic is where I find that I have certain points of my life or learning experiences in my life that I'm holding on to. My, my kids are young, right? Uh, well, I have my stepdaughter, she's 13. So, but my, the boys, they're, they're a lot younger now. And I don't feel that I've gotten to that point or they've done something in their lives. Like, like I'm waiting for them to crash their car or something or, or <laughs> my car or something where I can actually put in that living experience, uh, into them. But do you feel that there's a lot of uh, moral code that you can teach younger kids? that are experiences that you've dealt with being in the Marines or working overseas that you find that they will understand as a young child? Yeah, I think there's a couple of good examples. So my oldest is uh, in second grade now, but real life playground issues have been happening since kindergarten. Right. And it, for them, it's just as real as a real life issue with coworkers that work for you. Like yeah. we think and dismiss it. But their world, the issue is just as strong whether you got yelled at you by your boss today. Like they perceive them this, the exact same. Absolutely. You should treat them yeah. the exact same. And you dismiss yeah. them, you're only causing her to internalize that feeling as bad. So a good example of this is my oldest daughter. There's lots of times there's a situation in the playground that maybe the girls do something bad or she's figuring out why boys, boys are chasing her type questions. And there was something we started one of the first revisions of this was called bird poop talk. And so there was a, bird, a book that I was called uh, one day a bird will poop on you. And essentially says, no matter what, how good your day is at some point, someone could, a bird could fly by and poop on your shoulder. Right. And yeah. we talk about it. Cause like, it's cool. So many times kids can poop on each other with no intent or no impression on each other. And or you could be having the best day and just someone completely comes by and ruins it. Yeah. And so we'll just talk about it at nighttime. We use bedtime talk as a time for safety where it's calm, the emotions are nice, we're getting ready to, to go to bed. The same with our house, yeah. And another more recent one is, so my oldest has been struggling with, that she often feels like everything is her fault. And it's kind of part that she's the oldest, so you have higher expectations. Yeah. And you expect her to try to set a better example. But from her perspective, it's like she can never do anything right. right. And then I was like, you know what? There was a time where daddy had a similar situation. It was called boot camp. And in boot camp, <laughs> there's 80 people and 80 people are punished for one idiot. Yeah. Every time someone messes up, we were all punished no matter what. And it was all about the team effort. And we all had to work as together as a team in order to protect each other. Yeah. 
that was an example I extracted from my life. And she understood and actually wanted to know more. She probably asked like five follow-up questions to that story. Right. And I think we, it miss, we need to engage in this one fundamental idea that kids and adults, they want to be validated in what they're feeling. Like so many times the brain's first response is, I am the only one suffering this emotion. Absolutely. And the moment you can br- create a bridge of empathy, like I know exactly what you're feeling. And if you use a story to illustrate it, stories are powerful ways to illustrate that validation. You can create that empathy and that empathy builds trust. And, and I kind of like to say when it, the, like the kids are young, like my youngest is bedtime talk because we tell jokes, but it's still a very safe place that I'm preparing for when we have heavier talks. But you want to be there when the kids are bringing you the easy things. Like all of these things are easy right now. And because if you build trust when it's easy, they'll be trustful when it's the hard things. But if you're oh, not yeah. there for the easy things, they won't bring you the hard things. Yeah, And a yeah. lot of, of the future teenage issues are prepped with the trust that you build when they're younger. Like, and do, you ever kids feel and that, my kids. do you ever feel that sometimes you're teeter-tottering over the fact that, oh, if I screw this up here, they're not going to ask me when they're older? Like, for example, trust issues you talk about. Well, if you give them bad advice when they're younger, they may not be asking you for advice when they're older or as they're gradually getting older. You want to... Obviously, you're not going to have all the answers. No, no parent does. But there are situations where even us as parents are stumped, right? Well, if I was six years old, how would I handle this situation? I know how to handle it as a 38-year-old. Do you want me to give you that example? Yeah. <laughs> like, like, and, and then, the, then you give the child the example or not even as, as, a, as a six-year-old, but then they're like, well, that's not the answer I wanted. And then you're like, oh. But then you feel bad because you've given them what is correct advice to what you think would be correct advice as a child, but it's not correct advice in their own opinion. So do you ever feel that that's kind of something that you feel that maybe sometimes you tiptoe around when you're getting, trying to give advice to younger kids? Yeah. And oftentimes, like I remember in the beginning, I think it was before even my son. So it was just like my first daughter. I often would say, daddy knows everything. That was something I said often. Yeah you get to a point where the, the hat comes off or the smoke screen goes away and then they start right. figuring out that daddy doesn't know doesn't everything. Know so, yeah. And that one came back to haunt me because they would constantly remind me like, you said you knew everything you lied. Yeah. And, but even now I would say the one thing that we often don't overlook is, and our two primary objectives, and this is a good way to wrap it around for your kids or for your son, you want to be their first hero. So you want to be the person they look to live up to in life and what they example they identify with as a man and as a woman you want to be the first person they love you want to be that first person that they connect with as a father because that example in and itself will be the example she goes out and searches for another soulmate like yeah the joke about the shotgun dad that shotgun dad if he lived the right life has nothing to worry about but the shotgun dad that didn't live up to his to a standard and sets the bar extremely low he's going to be terrified because she's going to match and compare every person she dates by the man that you were so if you want her to have high standards you need to have high standards and if those two objectives are kind of your ultimate end so everything else below that can be washed away because like they're going to be forgiving like adults don't forgive and forget that easy because we have a lot of stories we have a lot of everything packed behind different triggers but yeah. for kids like they forget and forgive like 10 minutes like I can be called the worst daddy or anything in one minute and 15 minutes later, we're playing trains and he doesn't even remember it. Yeah. Like we have to remember they're only interpreting their world with the information they have. Yeah. And the tool that often when you do get it wrong, say you lose your temper or you scream, ask for forgiveness. Like kids can forgive just as easily as another kid to a kid. So put, put that example out there of daddy's not perfect. Like that's an important thing to teach. Like, I don't want you to model perfection. I want you to model you and I'm not going to get it right. And something I usually say is, you know how you're trying to be six years old? Well, daddy's still trying to figure out how to be 35. And every day I'm trying to figure it out, just like you're trying to figure out how to be your age. And every day I wake up is the first day I've ever had that day. So there's a whole lot to figure out and we need to have that, just that space or that empathy to understand. We can't just assume what they, what the world they're seeing. Like they have a limited amount of information. Another one that I usually get, uh, I got caught up on, and I just figured it out last uh, fall. It was something like responsibility. I probably have said you're not responsible or you need to be responsible a hundred times, maybe probably a thousand, maybe even more. But then it hit me. I was like, 
I don't know if she knows what that definition is. Right. So then it, it came from like, do we have common vocabulary? I assume responsibility because everyone knows it. But I, so I went to my eight year old and she didn't have any idea what a true definition of responsibility was. Or right. um, I'm trying to think of the other word that goes with, I can't think of it, but just like, so then we had, at a bedtime talk, we talked about what it means to be responsible. Like we gave examples. I gave examples in my life. We used stories. That common vocabulary now allows us to have a bigger conversation. So a lot of times we go into a conversation with these big words that we think everybody understands, but they've only been on this earth for a certain amount of years. And very few people slow down to make sure they understand those definitions of those words that you're trying to get them to go yeah, I agree. I think that we all get caught up in that for sure. I know for myself, I try to use as small to the point vocabulary as possible, but at the same time, educating them on what new words are. But I mean, you get caught up in the emotion of whatever situation you're dealing with. And you as a adult is just you're, you're having verbal diarrhea of whatever that situation <laughs> was just to get the idea out of your head. And you're like, oh, yeah, well, how is he going to know that? Or how is she going to know that? And then afterwards you think about it. And then you, then, like you said, you're going back to your child and going, Oh, I'm sorry. That's not what dad meant. What dad meant was like a, B and C instead of X, Y, Z, which you can always ask for forgiveness. Cause it's, oh, 100%. it's, it's, it's such a great example. And it take it's a good lesson in your humility because yeah. as a parent, if you're not demonstrating humility, then you're really just hiding a version of yourself to your kids that someday later on, they'll figure out that you were just being someone that you're not. Or everybody's and always it's very important to model that authenticity. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, and like, just think of how like the division of Instagram, like there's Instagram life and then there's real life. Yeah. Like you don't ever want them to think that there's two versions of them. And so no. you shouldn't have two versions of yourself. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. Um, so let's get on to leadership. You do have a lot of people on your show that do talk about leadership. Uh, what do you feel is a good definition of a good leader? I think a good leader is one that inspires to continue learning himself, but then really has the emotional capacity to connect to the people around him. Okay. Because oftentimes like leadership is kind of confused with this idea that you can just be a good leader. Like, and it's just taking all your actions and all that will create a good leader or you just get put in that position and that's a leadership position. So you can just be that leader. Right. Like it comes from within and I'm a big fan of heart center leadership. So, and it's also gonna be called like servant leadership, but heart center leadership is like what Southwest airlines runs on and, and Southwest airlines is leadership philosophy is you connect with the people first. Like their hiring philosophy is you train for heart and hire for skill because they can teach someone to vacuum an airplane, but they can't teach someone to care about vacuum yeah. an airplane. Right. And so at the core of their leadership philosophy is being heart centered always learning how to connect their purpose of why they exist is to connect people to the most important destinations in their life, which is why they focus on the people and create amazing memories when people are doing it because that's their purpose. So leadership to me is when you connect with people, you connect with those frequencies that make people great and help the, the best parts of themselves come out. Right. And do you find that there are leaders out there that struggle with that? and that feel that they need they need to prove something to themselves so they act a completely different way than they model than they need to model themselves over like for example if somebody is a um well we do see it in the military quite a bit or not quite a bit but we do see it in the military but um where they take their issues out on other people to make them look better at their position like they'll, they'll call people out for no apparent reason, or they'll call people out and they'll make them kind of ridiculed in front of their, their peers. Yeah. Do you feel that, that there is a lot of leaders that are like that and we need to kind of start teaching a little bit more of a morality type of coaching and leadership to all aspects of life, not just military, but work as well? I think we need to start speaking to a more connected life in general. That. At, I have something that um, is kind of beyond my brand currently, but I believe that if organizations help create more connected families at home, they can create more connected employees at work. But you're not going to create that if you have a boss that makes someone feel very crappy at work because of that crappy feeling at work 
is going to carry into the home and then their kids are going to feel that and then their kids are going to wonder why their mom hates them and, right and that was all because some boss early in the day yelled at them like right. it's a chain of events and it's but it's more about being connected like you shouldn't be at home thinking about work and you shouldn't be at work thinking about home because that doesn't engage either process to the point where you can actually like truly move the needle or really step into what you feel is a great mom and dad and so i think what we need to do within the leadership idea is really get used to this idea that it's more about the people it it's also about like the one lesson i like about fatherhood is you have to get people to do things your kids that are completely free will they don't have any discipline and you've got to try to get them corralled into a particular area there's a lot of good lessons in leadership and trying to get your kids to do different things without yeah. using force, like using yeah. logic or using connectedness or just getting them to do it easily. Like all of that can carry over into work if you put your mind to it. But those bosses that often look for control, control is a good word that often I think gets confused with leadership. Like you're not a leader if you use control to get people to do things because that control that often people seek externally as a leader is often just a reflection of the lack of control they have internally for yeah. whatever issues that maybe they're not dealing with. They seek that control in the people around them. And by having control of other people's lives, somehow that tells their brain that like, okay, we can live with this chaos on the inside as long as we have control on the outside. But all you do yeah. is just destroy people's lives and mess them up. So you have, to, and the part that also people mess up and it comes back to fatherhood, that humility. Like there is no perfect leader and you should never try to be a perfect leader. You should always be able to admit you're made a mistake, admit that you fell down, admit that you're learning just like they are. Yeah. And it's that growth process that often we're missing because yeah. a leader never stops learning and a leader never stops leading. And you need to continue to have that dialogue. Yeah. Because that's what continues to pull people forward. Like if you're growing and they see what you're doing and you're able to help pull them towards what objectives you're trying to do or who you're trying to become, or that becomes interesting, then that's how you get people to go with you. Yeah. Um, I want to hit on the admitting doing wrong. So I, I know personally a lot of examples that uh, I've dealt with other I've dealt with CEOs. I've dealt with other people that are in management or supervisor or roles and they either don't admit that they've done something wrong in fear of people judging them in the position that they're in. And I find that to be, um, well, I find it disheartening because I don't think that if you're in a position of, of authority, I think that proving that you're human is more of a benefit to your, to your, personality and, and to your to your position than trying to hide the fact that you can never do wrong mm -hmm. and usually what you were also hinting there is the ego and I, I i often describe ego as like wherever your ego is the strongest that usually means that's where you're actually trying to hide the biggest secret yeah. and oftentimes that leaders are using ego to resort that power to resort that control and they're creating a persona that says I belong here and I deserve to be here. But inside it's kind of like that Marine that I was saying, like the two versions, like the one guy said I was supposed to be here and the other version said, well, yeah. I'm waiting to be found out. Yeah. It was that ego that kind of got me through that process. And luckily it wasn't like something destructive, like it could be in the workplace, but that ego can be something that is just, I use it as a compass. So where I still feel my ego comes into play, that's a compass for me where I need to figure out what's in the shadow there and bring it into the light. Yeah. because that ego isn't going to help you. It's just going to push people away because the people have a very good sensitivity to when your, your ego's on because it usually pushes people away instead of draws them in. Yeah. And the more stuff you have in the light, the more people are going to like you for who you are, not for what you say or not anything around you or what position you have. Like you want people to see the value of what you have in the light, not just because of what says in the door. Yeah. You brought up uh, working working from home and not bringing work home with you. What do you think about the situation right now? <laughs> so I've kind of, and this is something I would say I'm still in the R and D lab with because everybody's in the R and D lab with this. But <laughs> when I lost my job on 20, January 27th, I went in with this idea. Like I really just want to be a stay at home dad, but I went in with the label. Like I want to be a, a stay at home dad that has a business. And I was like, okay, how, do I begin to engineer this life? And it took about four weeks of experimentation 
And the crazy part is the week before COVID hit, I had it figured out. Like I yeah. had my perfect week where my daughter went to daycare three and a half days a week. That was part-time. They gave limited cost to that. That gave me like between nine and three to work on my business and went Monday through Wednesday. I had Fridays with my daughter. Yeah. I was doing the cooking, the cleaning in the house. And the after, before and after that, I was getting to the gym. And I called it my dad integrated life because I just kept tweaking the process to get the work that I needed done. And every day that I didn't, it didn't work. I just got like, okay, how, what can we change? A continue and continuous improvement process. And that kind of came from this, like maybe five years ago, I hit this point when everybody kind of hits this point where you have the ends of the day, you're at four o'clock, you look in your email and you're like, oh man, I never applied from that email at nine. And you get on your phone and you text your wife. You're like, I'm going to be late for dinner. I got to catch up on some emails or something came up. But then as I started doing that, I realized like there was 10 opportunities where I could have just stopped BSing, stop the conversation, get back from lunch a little bit quicker. Like how dare I take time away from my family for me being an idiot of time management during the day. Yeah. And that really said like, so then I got to this process that when five o'clock hit, I was like, okay, we're pulling the pin in this day and letting it go. And then I just try again tomorrow. Like it was just like, okay, this didn't work perfect, but what could I try different? And I just kept doing that continuous improvement through that process. And that kind of led me to my, my thesis on that, with that research of my trying to engineer that life was your calendar is kind of like your budget. So we all have budgets for a household and money. Well, if you yeah. treat your calendar like your like a budget, then you start budgeting your time like you budget your money. And then yeah. every hour of your day has a job and you look at your week ahead. So like on Friday, I would do like a weekly review. I would plan out my week. I would put on my calendar. This is when this needs to get done. I would even put on my calendar. I need to reply to this email because right. it was work. It needed 30 minutes. I would make sure it was there budgeted. Right. And if I wasn't having a plan for success throughout the week, I was planning to fail. And that really gave me the confidence to go into the weekend without thinking about work because it was all on my calendar. I trusted the process and I felt freer. And I would go home at the end of the day because if I didn't get it done or if I just it didn't get done, I would catch it up on Friday during my weekly review. I would reschedule it the next week. It was just yeah. kind of continuous. And same thing through this. I just kept continuing and improving. And even when this first hit, like at first I was kind of doing random meetings throughout the day. And my wife's a kindergarten teacher. So we're also, she's still trying to figure out how to teach virtually. Yeah. And it wasn't working that well. And it was partially with like the kids homeschooling. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to block off between eight and 10 every morning. I'm not doing a single thing except homeschool. And that's the safe space for that to happen. And it's booked off on my calendar. So it doesn't get booked. It doesn't get double booked even to the point where I haven't really done it since then or since COVID hit. But before I was even putting like, okay, this is where I'm writing down the grocery list. This is when I'm going grocery shopping right. because if I didn't give that time a job, I would easily find time or something to do in that time, but right. I had to give it a job. So for me, it was all about trying to create an integrated life. It's not a work-life balance. It's like, how do you integrate your dad hat and your work life into the same right. hat? Because yeah. treating them separate just kind of like takes just more energy. Like you want to learn how it can be integrated. And that really led us into the play of like, and you always err on family. Like that's something else I've, I've done. Like if it's a decision between family and business, boom, easy choice like the family, like it's less time to work in my business, but Hey, I do homeschooling in the morning. And the only thing I really do now during the day is meetings or conversations like podcasts or this episode. And I pushed all my personal work into the evenings or into the mornings because I wanted to create that space for my wife to focus on teaching. Cause it's still the very hard time for her to get through. And as a man, I wanted to create that space for her to feel safe that she could kind of grow through it without all the extra pressures of, running the household or doing laundry. And yeah, like even this week, I've, I've really felt like I've, I've really stepped in this because it's taken me probably the full six weeks to figure this out, but just on Monday of this week. So this week is it's Tuesday when we're recording this yesterday, I was up at six 30. I, I read, I meditated. I went and got the kids lunch or breakfast put out on the table because they weren't all down yet. So I had it all set. I had their juices and everything ready to go. I went downstairs, did my workout in the basement, came up, showered, started homeschooling at eight o'clock right after that then we kind of go into free time or recess that we call it and i go outside maybe i had a few phone calls that day i did all the laundry i got half the sheets and the pillows washed that day and i started dinner about 3 30 in the afternoon we had a nice dinner 
but I did that, but I went in there with a plan to get it all done. And I accepted responsibility for what I wanted to do. And I just kept integrating more things into that day with that plan. Do you find that you are able to time management that easily with a family and your business? And like, do you not find that there's a lot of monkey wrenches that get thrown into the system where you're just every like, day? Okay, well, yeah. So how do you how do you cope with dealing with those type of situations? You just kind of realize that none of you have no, no control over any of it. Like, yeah, control is an illusion, and that is something I repeat often because as human beings and in and military, we love control. So yeah. that you 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 can go in with a plan, and a plan is generally only good about five minutes after it's made, but it makes you feel good. You've got at least some execution plan. Yeah. But then you just kind of kind of, and it's probably maybe a little bit of the Marine spirit of improvise, improvise, adapt, and overcome that you just keep improvising and taking the information in this moment and trying to make the the next right step to quote frozen to there because <laughs> no one has it all figured out. And yeah. the, the part that you have to like, as a dad, you have to admit and give yourself grace that you're just trying your best. Like if you didn't get it all done, like you just say, okay, that was my best. You know what? Tomorrow is another day and just keep trying to innovate and try new things and keep talking about, it, keep communicating. Oftentimes something that usually gets dads in trouble is, They'll create a expectation and then they'll be upset when that expectation wasn't done by someone else. But really I've kind of framed it like this. An expectation is just something you agreed to yourself in your head and you most likely yeah. haven't verbalized it. But if you agree to something, that's something you had to verbalize. And we far too often use expectations way too much because all they are is just agreements with yourself. And those yeah. aren't going to do anybody good because nobody knows about them. And you're always going to be right. upset because <laughs> yeah. no one can read your mind. So you you're really just have to make sure you're emotion. communicating and grace yeah. and every day something changes because yeah. even today, like I, I have to go on a, I'm part, I'm doing a health challenge and I have to go on a walk every day. Prior to this, it was completely massively raining outside. And I was like, man, I'm going to have to go on a walk today or I'm going to have to go walking in the rain, which I've done before. But I was like, I could have, I should have planned better and checked the weather in the morning so I can maybe get it done then versus right. procrastinating and doing the afternoon. That's something I'll take in tomorrow when maybe, look at the weather to try to plan my walk better. Cause I almost got screwed by having to take a walk in the downpour. Yeah. Every day is just another opportunity to integrate a little bit better, but just yeah. like Legos, it can all smash apart and you got to rebuild whatever you're building. And every, yeah. I got actually good. There's a good uh, analogy because every time I tell my dog, my kids, when like Legos break or we build airplanes a lot and I'm like, they'll break and they'll get super sad. And then I'm always like, every time Legos break, it's another opportunity to rebuild the better. Yeah. That's a lot that's a pretty good equivalent to life. Like it's going to break. Legos are going to fall apart no matter how yeah. good or how much yeah. structure you put around to make sure it all stays together. Yeah. It's only one crazy kid and one crazy foot away from smashing apart. Yeah. Every time it breaks, you learn how to build it better and it gets a better airplane every time it breaks. What do you do for your own time? I mean, dad's need time. So how do you decompress? Decompress. I've so the walks that I've started doing have been really helping because sometimes I'm with the kids, sometimes I'm by myself. The I've been using the the calm map. I'm on like on day 34 of my stretch. So I've really taken COVID as a gift because it's probably the easiest my life is ever going to get. Now I don't have a job, so my perspective is a little bit biased. And I was on unemployment before it was cool here. But this whole idea has allowed me to really solidify a lot of habits, like a reading routine. I've been reading 15 pages for the last 35 days every morning right after my meditation yeah that kind of looking to his, the other way to say it is i look for ways to reconnect with my heart and when you reconnect with your heart versus your head you connect with that emotion that raw energy of being a father or even just yeah. the strength of being masculine like hugging my kids getting into their imagination like that's kind of like where my escape is but at the same time where i find more connection or more time to just relax is talking to dad. So what tool to create that I created with friendships and talking to people, I've joined multiple dads groups and I have had multiple zoom calls throughout the week. I hosted a, a, a weekly zoom call in a mastermind community that I'm a part of that connection is ultimately what helps get me through. And it's something we underestimate. So for millennia, men survived in tribes with other men. We did life together. We shared the load that there was always life was going to give you more than one person can handle. And you always had people at different wisdom levels to help you through that. You never had to assume that you had to have all the answers. So in the last right. 200, as men went to work versus staying in the farm, 
we kind of lost all that and we discredit that in the human in desire for war connection with other men to share the load, get wisdom, help someone else lift something that's too heavy. And that's honestly where I feel most alive right now because and that gets me excited because when I help someone, they help me. And it's often, you, you can easily can listen to the voice inside your head that tells you that you're not exactly the dad that people love. But when you have men surrounding you, help reflecting back that love and energy of who you are, your personality, it's a very good, strong reminder that you are a great person, you are a great father. And that's almost help, what helps get me through the most of times. You were talking about a uh, life coach. Um, what got you on the idea of helping others? Partially probably the leadership, but when I was in the, um, the idea of the side hustle, I was like, and the other part of my personality is whatever I put my mind to, I usually fall in love with yeah. because my career, I started in generators when I got the Marine Corps. I went to teach people how to work on generators. Then I went to tech support for generators. Then I went to IT and then I yeah. ended my career in marketing. So like completely all different <laughs> things. Yeah. And I fell in love with each, each one of those. So I was like, my problem was like, how the hell do you pick a side hustle when everything you start, you fall in love with? Like I had probably 30 ideas that I would have easily loved any of them. And then I, I don't remember where I did. But then it was probably, I just started realizing like life coaching was a thing. And I was like, a life coach kind of needs to be good at everything. And I'm kind of good at everything. I was like, mate, I wonder if this is a perfect match in heaven. And so I originally went into with this idea, I even had a name for it. It was going to be called Your Reflection Coaching. I was going to reflect back what you couldn't see as a mirror. And that lasted for about a month. And then I was actually uh, reading a fiction novel, Tom Clancy. And there was a Marine at Arlington Cemetery. And it hit me in that exact moment. This book sucked. I didn't even finish it. But they gave me this gift <laughs> that I was like, I could life coach veterans. I'm a veteran. I'm already part of the community. They're, they're already going to trust me. I was like, this yeah. is it. And so then that started the next two years before my podcast journey of really figuring out what that value was. And it was an idea, but I didn't feel like I could become that idea. I didn't have, have enough belief. I kind of still had a, a dumb farm boy in Wisconsin in me, but now I've kind of working to almost completely defeat that story. And now the story has changed to um, Ben Cloy, I'm a farm boy from Wisconsin that's gonna help change the world. Right. What do you think are some struggles that veteran dads have that is kind of, uh, I wouldn't say, baseline or, or a blanket term, but what do you think some, what do you think they all kind of have that are in relation to each other? I think the one that hit, we don't realize it, like the friendships part, we don't realize how much we instinctively loved having a tribe around us in the military. Yeah. You don't realize how much, you don't realize the magic of how it worked and where it did pick you up when you needed to lift or where knowing that the brother to the right always had your back. You don't realize that when no one has your six, like what that means on the other side. And I think the most commonality between probably the, every one of your listeners in law enforcement and military, any person that serves with the community in one place and then goes back to normalcy in another, you don't realize the value of that tribe because that human connection is what's going to, that's, to me, like it's one of the very first steps that if you don't have a strong network in place around you, start there. Even if you're listening to this and you're like, oh, I wish I could be as good or I have much insight or as good as dad as Ben Coy is. And I make mistakes every day, but I wouldn't necessarily start at fatherhood because when you show up at fatherhood, you aren't going to necessarily feel like you're supposed to be there. And that creates this internal struggle in your head. Right. But if you start at community, if you start at people that are just random strangers that you become friends with that continues to validate validate this idea that you're someone interesting and if you can gain confidence with strangers that was what helped me step back into fatherhood because i i was surrounding myself with great dads on the internet and those dads helped reflect back the father that i was and so that allowed me to go back towards it so if you go into being a dad and you're feeling lonely on, on the inside you're what you get from you're going to be giving consistently as a father but you need to have people pour into you as well. And if you try to go into fatherhood without having people pour into you, you're going to run empty very quickly and you need to make sure your cup's filled, but it's not on you to fill it up all the time. Like you can have, you can do meditation, you can find space to read, but a lot of what that energy comes in is just being surrounded by other men and whether it be playing poker, sometimes it, maybe the traditional banter is watching a sports game together or something like that. 
there's something about that connection when you feel like that, when you feel connected and understood by someone else that you don't know. And a good example of this is, so the community that I was a part of was the Dad Edge out of St. Louis, Larry Hagner. And he had a summit in 2018. I had only met these dads on the internet. So I drove to St. Louis and met a bunch of strangers I met on the internet in person. Yeah. Yeah. So that sounds weird saying, and I've never done anything like it my entire life. And the imposter yeah. syndrome walking into this room was so real. Like I felt like, what are they going to say? Am I going to match the person they've come to like on the internet? And they quickly started, I started handshaking because that's what I felt safe with, or I didn't feel comfortable hugging, even though this community <laughs> is already are like, they're mostly huggers. And then quickly, yeah. like the second person upgraded to a hug. And so then I just kind of leaned into it. By the end of that two day summit, I somehow got labeled as the guy that gave the best hugs. I've never been a hugger my entire life. All mm. 33 years of being on this planet, I would never have felt comfortable hugging someone. But somehow, being surrounded with 60 guys that are heart-centered, that are in a space of helping me be a better person, helped yeah. that come out. And it's still something that I lean into today, that instead of handshaking, I'm generally going to hug you, especially if I know you at any point in time, I'm going to walk up to you and hug you. I haven't figured yeah. out how that's going to look after COVID-19, but prior, <laughs> I was always going to give you a hug I, I and it's almost like my signature <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, because, but that wasn't there before. I didn't bring yeah. that feeling to my kids until it was helped pulled out by others. So now, would that's what you I'm saying, felt the same, engage with the community felt, first. Would you have felt the same way prior to you starting to go out and meet friends and, and become more uh, social? Would you have still said yourself more of that or would you, you, you would have still been that turn left type of person? Um, I think it takes the right community and this community that Larry put together, he's like, it, he, it's, it's very, not necessarily filtered in a bad way, but he lets the right growth mindset, people that are willing not to judge, like there can be bad communities that tear you down versus build you up. Yes. So I think it takes the right one. So just going to a random meetup, I probably wouldn't have happened. But if I would have gone to a space or even a community event at, say, church and a bunch of dads are meeting, I would put that as a very safe place to go and try to, to connect with other fathers. So it's not a blanket statement. And I don't think it would have worked. I wouldn't have done it because it was yeah. still networking in general was still something that was scaring. Yeah. And when I went to that summit in St. Louis, I was still running on the, dad from the dads in the park operating system that dads at the park are Good, good dads and that's a safe place for me right. to be and it still took an entire different level of growth for me to start going out and saying hello to strangers and walking up to networking events and having no idea anybody in that room have that's you done any more different... since then i've been to back to that summit twice now and um after i i, re I never quite had enough time within my with between a job podcast and family to really strongly network but since i lost my job it's something that i've been doing a lot more of i've or I was doing prior to COVID, like I was going to different uh, veteran meetups. I was going to chamber of commerce meetups because I have a, like the, I think I mentioned this, that the, the amount of opportunity you have is directly proportional to the amount of strangers. So like, I'm looking for a lot of opportunity now. So I need to increase the ratio on the amount of strangers yeah. I'm talking to. And now it's comfortable. I've been to conferences, podcast conferences, which is also a safe place. Like everybody is kind of a good person that pays thousand yeah. dollars to go to a conference. So <laughs> you're kind of already got a nice filter in place that you're, you're not going to get destroyed or, or yeah. annihilated yeah. and you're going to get the better parts of yourself pulled out as well. What, uh, you said you went to some podcasting conferences. What were those like? Absolutely amazing. So the first one podcast movement, I went oh, last yeah, yeah. year, but I yeah. actually bought the ticket before I even had a podcast. It was kind of like my accountability partner. I'm either going to have a podcast or I'm going to want to start one, but I'm going to go no matter what, like I need a podcast in my life. And that community, like it was because what you don't realize about podcasting from the outside is it's just a tool. It's not the niche. Yeah. And so when you go to a conference, that's about the tool, not the niche, you get so many different types of people in a good way, because you get connected with different souls of flavor. If you think of, of, the conference is Baskin Robbins. There's three, 32 different places of ice cream. And that's the only place you can really connect with all those different niches of that tool. Yeah. You can connect people that do like women type yoga and, and women's coaching or health coaching or energy coaching. Like that's a world that you have no way to really get exposed to unless Absolutely. you go there and you randomly yeah. say hello yeah. to someone. There's so many different niches. So it just expands 
expand your mind up again what's possible of what you can bring into your life yeah and this past year i just the year i went to podfest which is even more community minded and chris Kamitso does an amazing job of making sure that community and connection is the one thing that's valued most and he did this really cool speed networking roundtable event and that there were so many cool things that happened one of them being there was this mom that um, she did editing for podcast and she was talking like she wants to have one about postpartum depression for moms and i was like what are you waiting for because like my, my podcast like somewhere yesterday there was a dad that died killed himself because of depression and if I didn't have my podcast, nobody would be there kind of to talk to him. Like somewhere a mom just died and that kids no longer have mom and the husband just lost his wife. Your voice could help break, make sure that they always have their mom around. Like yeah. you need to start yesterday and like four women started crying at the table. And because it's just a very beautiful place where you can help others. Like in that moment, I helped pull her podcast out that she really didn't believe in herself. So what you're saying is a lot of people cry around you. I do have that tendency. I, po I cry positively and negative. I, I cry in the movie Elf when the sleigh goes riding over the people. Oh, yeah. I yeah. cry in the sad endings. It doesn't matter. I, I, I remember sitting in Okinawa watching a tree makeover, and every time the bus moved, I would cry my eyes out, but I always had the door closed. <laughs> good, good. Um, so, can you give us some advice uh, to other dads out there that are just starting out as a fatherhood, um, and what not what they can expect because every fatherhood is going to be different, but um, things that they can work on with themselves just to be a better father. I think one piece of advice that gets in the way of marriage and kids is you can't love and be right at the same time. Right. If you're arguing with your wife. If you're, if you're arguing with your kids about who's right and who's wrong, then you genuinely, you're general, you genuinely can't love them at the same time. You're trying to detract from that love that you committed to if it was your wife or that you know you have for your kids if you're trying to prove you're right. Mm -hmm. So you need to lean into love more than being right. And whatever you're trying to be right for, that's not what you're here for. That's not your reason why you got married. You got married because you love this woman. So and whatever she's bringing you isn't something that being right or wrong is probably not even what really is upset. So you're just wasting energy on something that's not the real issue. Mm -hmm. So just continue to love everything through it. I think on the dad side, realize that there are so many people that enter this journey every single day around the world. Just realize that you just need like, like every question in fatherhood has generally been answered. You just need to know the right dad that can help you solve yeah. it. So start building those simple network of dads because it only takes like maybe three or four dads to mastermind together and you you can start shortcutting these processes and not have to learn it all on your own. And that will be, cancel out that feeling that it's all on you because yeah. life will give you more than you can handle. And it's why it's so important to share the load, why you need that tribe, even if it's simple as three dads that you meet with at the park once every Sunday together and talk about life. Like that will change your life exponentially. That connection, yeah. that feeling, that feeling of just seeing another dad at a different part and inspiring you to be more like him or taking the best parts and maybe leaving the parts you don't like, that's going to help you be a better dad. I think something else is at the end of the day, just remember your kids just need your love and that on the worst day, the only thing that they really need is your time. And they measure, they spell time T I or they spell, they spell love T I M E. Yeah. And that if you want to show them you love them, just give them 10 minutes. It's all yeah. you, 10 minutes of your time. One-on-one, -on -one, one and one will be a game changer for how you, how they react and go forward for the rest of the day. Cause whatever yeah. they're, whatever yeah. they're feeling, whatever they're doing, it's almost always rooted in a deficit of time and yeah. your connection with them is love. No, I couldn't agree more because every time my youngest one comes up to me and says, dad, play with me, it melts my heart and I stop whatever I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. I even set a timer on my phone for 10 minutes and say like, okay, you got my attention for 10 minutes and yeah. they understand that they know when it, the phone rings, it's over, but yeah. their mood is so different after that 10 minutes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, tell their listeners where they can find you um, and what your show's called. Give them all the info. So our, everything is on militaryveterandad.com is the website. The podcast is by the same name. It's pretty much on every platform that you can possibly imagine. I think the only one that I've been struggling with is Pandora. They have a really kind of uh, hard process to get their customer support to answer emails, but everywhere else it's on. You can even ask Alexa to play military veteran dad. And I'm on 
on Instagram if you want to catch me up or just have a conversation about as open as a book you can get. And my my handle is at Ben underscore Cloy. The podcast has a handle at Military Veteran Dad. Just send me a, a, a direct message on Instagram. More than willing to respond. Have a conversation. I try to always gift friendship, which is the one thing that I wish I had in my life. So I always try to be the friend I wish I had five years ago. And off for your listeners, check out freedadcourse.com. There's a five free lessons on fatherhood and essentially a five free lessons on how to create more friends in your life.